And again, for the, I think it's fairly well described on the web page, so uh, more or less that's it. Again, uh, we're not going to have a class on next Tuesday, and next Thursday we're going to begin 15 minutes early. Thank you to those of you who participated in the previous discussion, and to the ones to, to those of you who are going to prepare for the last discussion. I'm also going to present a brief overview of the of the class when 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 we finish, just to remind you about the lots of topics that we studied. Uh, and there is one topic that we need yet to cover, and this is fabrication of photonic and electronic materials by self-assembly. In a way, this is my favorite topic because it's related to to what I do. Uh, but uh, this has been a, a, a source of significant scientific, industrial, and uh, governmental interest in the last few years. Um, and I'm going to explain the concepts very briefly and then uh, discuss how this, these concepts can be applied to different types of self-assembled systems. Uh, it is very much related to the engineering on the nanoscale. So we usually have the habit of beginning with some nice, interesting picture. Now, what does this look like? Um, on a first, on a first glance, it looks like a fancy full block of houses and, and apartments and so on. Uh, but actually, this is a vision. Not that somebody is, has made anything like that yet. But this is a vision of how eventually one day you can have structures which operate on the optical processing of information very much similarly to the way computer chips do processing of electrical signals these days. So instead of electrical signals, you have optical signals. You have pulses of light which travel to, those, to, the, to these chips and get processed. And certainly you have heard about uh, uh, computer connections and so on, and you understand the issue of bandwidth in the sense of how much you can speed up and increase the amount of information that you can process if you do the transition from uh, electricity to light. Now, there is a very significant problem with light, and we're going to discuss this. Now, wh what, you, what you see here is actually structures on a micrometer, on a micrometer and sub-micrometer scale. So those trees here would be comparable to the wavelength of light, let's say a few hundred nanometers. You can see these materials here, which are essentially transparent blocks of, of, of matter, which have air bubbles embedded in a specific way inside them. You can also see those optoelectronic switches or something like that, which is really shown here, where we have eventually electricity and light coming together. You can see here those forests of green in this case. Obviously, you won't be able to see color on that lens scale. Uh, you forest of green of green uh, rods, which have those openings and which serve as waveguide, as I'm going to describe just in a second, about the, um, how the, the photonic crystals uh, and photonic materials work. You can see those arrays of holes and so on. All those structures are intended to process, manipulate, move lights between the, the box which process the information. Now, this is a very nice uh, kind of vision. This vision has been stated by uh, some people who are physicists uh, no more than six or seven years ago. There is still a very, very active area of research going on in, the, in, the, in that direction. Now, what makes those things comparable to coets? The lens scale. If you remember, the sizes of coets particles vary from nanometers to micrometers. And this is the lens scale of the things that we have here that we're interested in. So potentially, the co this, these are essentially colloidal structures, if you think of them from the view of colloidal science. And as it happens, people have found out that you can use colloid science to assemble similar things, as I'm going to demonstrate in this lecture. But before we do that, I'm going to go and just describe briefly what we're speaking about here and what are those blocks, uh, <coughs> rods, trees, and so on, like shown on, on that image. And the concept is, very, is really very simple. Imagine that you take a couple of materials which have different refractive indexes. 
which also mean different power visibility. If you remember the refractive index is equivalent to power visibility. You can form microscopically or nanoscopically layered periodic structure by using those two materials. You can form those periodic structure in one dimensions. You can form them in two dimensions. Or what would be of biggest interest is to form them in three dimensions. So again, one typical length scale here would be about the wavelength of light. Now, what happens when you shine light on such a material? You have to consider how the electrical field of the, of the light is going to penetrate through the material. Now, this material is periodic. The electrical field itself is periodic too. So in order to penetrate, you have to consider how the periodicity of the electrical field is going to kind of, in a way, superimpose itself on the periodicity of the material. And uh, again, like if you, if you would like to think a little bit more physically, how do you connect those periodicity of the two, of the two, of the two uh, uh, interacting media here, the periodicity of the, of, the, of the material and the periodicity of light? Now, all physical properties of light penetration can be uh, uh, solved by solving this system of Maxwell equations. Of course, solving it is never easy. But at least you can consider how the system goes. What are the parameters? Now, you have the vector of the electrical field of the light. And you have the, we the vector of the magnetic field of the light. As you know, light is an electromagnetic wave. You can see how these vectors are going to change in time by these equations. And you can see how they're going to change in space by these equations. Now, what you can see here is that you also have in that equation and in this equation, you also have the polarizability or the refractive media index of the media. In this refractive index, you have a vector, a vectorial quantity here. This refractive index is dependent on the position of the, on the running coordinate. So in a sense, these two equations tell, tells you that Whatever happens when the light, light moves through the media, it is going to interact through the media in a certain way. And supposedly that the media is uniformly periodic, then the light is going to be superimposed on that uniformly periodic media. Now, you can think of some conditions when it is kind of, in a way, coincides, the periodicity of the light coincides with the periodicity of the media, like shown here, like this minima. And the next minima, minima and the next minima correspond to stripes of this material. And uh, the maxima also corresponds to stripe of this material or this one here, where they correspond to the stripes in the other material. Now, this is going to be the case where the light is obviously going to kind of there. There can be interference effects. There can be a variety of other effects. Now, imagine, however, that the wavelength is kind of, in a way, incompatible with that periodicity. That your wave, that your, your wave is kind of like goes like that. So its minima and maxima correspond to different types of material. I guess, kind of, I mean, if we say this very, very, kind of, in a way, profanely, if you're a wave, you wouldn't feel kind of I mean like really being in the, ma in the material like that if you don't really have correspondence between the periodicities. So the bottom line here is that the light can penetrate such a material or it can be reflected back. So the material can be in a way light favorable or it can be light unfavorable. And um, you have actually seen such materials if somebody has... Um, anti-reflective coated uh, glasses or something like that. Those covered filters on, on glasses and so on, and usually made by depositing thin periodic layers of metals. That's why they have this specific strong color. You can think of the foam film as being the material like that, but only with one periodicity. And you have already seen the intense colors. 
So we have this periodic, we have this periodic material, we have the periodic light superimposed on the material. Then again, this is physicist type of thinking. Now what happens? What are the if we have an infinitely periodic material, what are the frequencies and angles of light that can penetrate through such a material? In a way, these are zones which are allowed. So if we have a light at this frequency and this angle, it is going to penetrate to the material. What is interesting, however, is that if you are here in the so-called photonic band gap, light wave, which has this frequency and this angle, cannot penetrate through the material. It just cannot, cannot superimpose itself on the material. It gets kind of, in a way, rejected. If it gets rejected, then it's going to be essentially reflected back from a general perspective. The point is that it cannot penetrate the material, and it cannot penetrate not because it's reflected, it cannot penetrate because of its structure. So again, you can see these are allowed gaps and these are non-allowed gaps, the yellow ones. Then there is another allowed gap. Now, for example, one of those gaps can be the gap where, let's say, the light is superimposed on, on one of the types of the materials. The other one will be the one where the light is superimposed on the other one. So you can think of this gap, for example, being corresponding to this case and this gap corresponding to that case. This gap is going to correspond to when you have a wavelength of two times the, 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 the length here, which is going to also be superimposed on the material, but in another manner. But again, it's going to correspond to some specific layers. Uh, so, there, so the bottom line is, and you wouldn't be expected to kind of immediately understand this, especially from the viewpoint of theory, how it works. The bottom line is that if you make this nice periodic material, it can reflect wavelengths of certain range, and it can let other wavelengths pass. Now, why is it this important? I mean, this is really the basics of all the big things about the photonic material, the so-called full photonic band gap. Now, why is this important compared to electricity? Now, what, what, is the, what makes light different from electricity? Um, let's say like that now. Is it easy to move electricity on a chip? Obviously, it's not difficult if people do it. Um, you, just make a, you just make a connector, putting down a wire, and the electricity is going to go through the wire. So if you, if you have something which goes like this, for example, okay, you can imagine how it goes. Well, it wouldn't work. Imagine that you have a wire which, which has a kind of like a right angle here. Now, the electricity would obviously go through that wire. It is going to take the right angle. Now, however, if you have, a, let's say, optical element, which goes at the right angle, is, is the light going to go like, I mean, take the right turn? No. It's not going to take the right turn because it, the light, light would, would like to go straight. Now, you can have fiber optics. You can say, well, we have fiber optics and it can make turns. But actually, if you study fiber optics, you find out that once you bend them, bend them at a certain angle, then the light is going to go out of the fiber optics, actually. Uh, so the problem is that if you want to manipulate one, one light on a chip, you don't have means of making it make right turns, for example, and making it make small turns and so on. Because the equivalent, you don't have an insulator for light, at least presently. But if you make such a material like that, this photonic band gap is actually, in effect, an insulator for light. The light wouldn't penetrate such a material, and then what's the big thing about that? If you make a material like this, let's say periodic in two dimensions, and if you shine a, a beam like that, the beam is going to go through this opening between the two slabs of the material. 
it's not going to get dissipated here because this is in effect a uh, insulator for light. I mean, light cannot penetrate this material. In, in, in either direction. I mean, it can penetrate it in, in either direction. I mean, that's why it has this Q. Now, let's say, I mean, like, that's a good question. I mean, you can say it can go this way or it can go that way. Now, the full photonic band gap, actually, should be the other way. The full photonic band gap is at any angle and at any frequency. So here, in this range of frequency at any angle, the light cannot penetrate the material. So whatever wave you put inside here is going to come out of the other way, you know, of the other side, without losses. And even more, if you take this material and um, let's say you make a channel like that, if you shine light through that channel, it's going to take the right turn and it's going to come off the other end, even though usually light cannot make right turns. This is a simulation, actually, of how the periodicity, how the, 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 the light intensity is going to go through a material like that. So you can see how the, the, the wave penetrates here and then takes the right turn and so on, and or, or goes straight. The point is that you don't have penetration in, inside this material here. Uh -huh. so the material, was it, was it red Amazon, the material is different than in the surrounding areas with the green column? Right. Um, you can think of this, for example, as being small, let's say, silicon. Imagining that silicon is transparent, which it is not. Mm -hmm. Small silicon uh, rods, for example which have a high refractive index, and then you have air around. And the interesting thing is that the light is not going to go to penetrate between these rods because their periodicity is incommensurate with the wavelength of the light. It's a very interesting concept, and it's not an easy one from theoretical viewpoint. You, you, you imagine that this concept has been developed just a few years ago. Analogous to changing the refractive index of a material? Not really. No. no. Why can't you just make a dimension material where you could have a gradient of the refractive index? Because you can't make uh, you can't make a gradient of the refractive index turn the light at ninety degrees, for example, can you? No, it's, it's not. And, and in many other cases, I'm going to show a few other applications right now. You also want resonators and so on. So you the only way to, 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 to make the light kind of go through such material is to make the material impassable for light. You can say, well, I can put a metal around here, and the light is going to get reflected by a metal. Because you know that when you see mirrors, I mean, you, you see your reflection in the mirror. The fact, however, is that metals have surface plasma resonances, and these are actually dissipative structures. So anytime light is reflected from a metal, it, it gets dissipated. Some of, some of the energy gets dissipated. So if you make a small channel through metal and try to make the light turn around the channel, it's actually going to bounce around like here, but, it's, but not much, if anything, is going to come out of the other end. It's going to get dissipated in the metal. Um, is this your question? Right. No, you, I mean, it's a matter of losses. I mean... When you do the calculations, you can you, you find out that mirror cannot work on that lens scale. Essentially, what's going to happen if is this were metal, this intensity of the light here is going to generate intensity of the electrons here, and because the electrons move through metal, now if the matter was semiconductor, you're going to have infinitely infinite reflection. But because you always have some dissipation of energy when the electrons move in the metal. It, it, very, it, it gets dissipated very fast, and, and, and nothing would come out. So the key about all that photonics is making this work. Let me show you the next slide, and then we're going to kind of, I mean, like just, just a few more questions. Uh, now, because the light cannot penetrate such a material, if you know how the lasers work, they need a resonance chamber. You need two mirrors, and the laser beam bounces between the, these two mirrors. Again, you can't make the mirrors too small. 
because they're going to dissipate energy. However, if you make, and this is already shown experimentally, however, if you make a structure like that and then generate this chamber here, you can have actually the light kind of resonating in, in, this, in this chamber here in the middle of the material. And this makes a small microscopic laser, so a laser on a microscopic scale. So this can be the driving force, for example, for your chip. And people have actually shown that, and they have shown that this laser is going to emit a spectra uh, similar to a laser, very sharp beam, and so on. Mm -hmm. So you can make lasers, you can make waveguides, different types of, uh, introducing different types of nonlinear elements, you can make amplifiers, and so on, as long as you can make the material. And that's where other types of scientists come in the play, because theoretically, from the viewpoint of theoretical physics, I mean, it's very easy to generate a material with a computer. But from the viewpoint of material science, it's not easy to make one, especially if you want to have this periodicity and this specificity. Um, Shalini had a question. Um, well, it's kind of, uh, I mean, like, it, uh, I mean, essentially the theory is going to tell that light at, at, at certain angle, at a certain frequency cannot penetrate into that. But let me give you an example, like, all those covered filters for the microscope and so on. Now, if you know what this filter is, it's essentially a layered structure of different materials. And when you look at it, you see that, you see that it reflects a certain color of light. Some light never goes through that. This is a one-dimensional photonic crystal from the viewpoint of this theory. So that's why, by the way, interference filters are the best filters in terms of they are very sharp. They will just let or reflect a very, very narrow beam of, uh, like, I mean, wave, wavelength of, of light. But, but another thing of capacitors that they're only allowed something in the box, right? Yeah, and well... Now, that, this is not a very kind of, I mean, like clear concept from the viewpoint of electrical engineering, I'm afraid. But, I mean, yeah, it's an analog of a filter, let's say, yeah. which is, in a sense, you can think of the light, if you, if you want to think of, you can think of the light resonating between these two viewers. At some wavelength, it's going to resonate because the wavelength is going to be comparable to the distance between the viewers. But if the distance between the viewers is not comparable to the wavelength of light, it cannot resonate. So finally, the light, I mean, it's, it's, it's very interesting. It's a material which does not allow light to pass through. Not because like metals, metals actually absorb light and then emit it back. But that's hard to see. Well, you can see it here. I mean, this is a simulation, but you can see no, here, for example, in that channel, you can see some penetration through the material, but it dies off. Okay. But it's like um, the, the distance between the pillars is actually... It's there is no pure here in the middle, though. It, so that distance corresponds is, or is commensurate to the uh, wavelength in some way. Right, uh, right. More, it's more, more, more precisely to say it's incommensurate um, to the wavelength. So the wave, I mean, like it just cannot resonate in a structure like that, and it essentially gets rejected. Um, Whoever is interested can visit Gionopoulos' website, actually, at MIT. There is a little bit more concept. Of course, there is this very nice book, Photonic Crystals. And this is a very, very interesting concept. I mean, it's one of the few new concepts in physics. Surprisingly, I mean, like, physics still comes up with new, interesting ideas. There are other interesting concepts, which we won't deal here, because they don't relate to coherent science, like the concept of a material with negative dielectric permittivity. Uh, but we won't go into this here. Uh, the, pro the point is now, the point is that if you can make such a material, you can make different types of s microscopic light processing devices, which can replace electrical devices in computer science, information processing, and so on. Okay. And it's very easy to make them one-dimensionally by depositing layer above layer. That's how people make filters. 
The question is, however, how do we make them in two dimensions and in three dimensions? And if you're if you about to tell me by photolithography, I can remind you that photolithography is actually a two-dimensional technique. You can't make, I mean, or at least you cannot readily make three-dimensional structures. You photolithography essentially project a pattern on the surface and then you replicate it. But then you cannot project another pattern and replicate it above the first pattern, at least not in the usual type of lithography. So making such materials in three dimensions and in two dimensions eventually is a problem. And that gives bread to people like us who are coits type of researchers. Because, let me just show this and we can take some questions. Because if you take a look at the assembly of spheres, colloidal crystal, you have eventually a three-dimensional material with, with well-defined periodicity and well-defined difference between the refractive indexes of the what's in the spheres and what's outside the sphere. <coughs> so colloidal crystals, those three-dimensional assemblies of, of particles and so on, are actually precursors, can be precursors for photonic materials, just because they are naturally three-dimensional periodic materials with different refractive indexes. Uh -huh. I, I just have a question. Can you make me go back to the slide? Yeah. Uh, the picture there on the top left, uh -huh. is this the cross-section? This is, this is the, the actual device itself. Yeah, but the channel that you talked about. No, 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 this is not a channel. This is just, I mean, in this way, the, li the light kind of, plane of the board? resonates here, yeah, in the plane of the board. The laser actually lazes in this direction, top and bottom, like parallel to the bar, in the plane of the bar. It's not perpendicular. No, because, I mean, they can't make it perpendicular, because to make it perpendicular, you need to make the structure three-dimensional, right? I thought it was three-dimensional. Yeah, no, what they did was, this is a two-dimensional structure. They, make the, they did this two-dimensional structure by microfabrication. So they can demonstrate that this structure can actually resonate like that in... In the in the plane of the of the of the image, and that's obviously not this useful. But then, if you can make it three-dimensional, then you can make different types of waveguides, and you can make it move, and, and and lots of other interesting things. Actually, some people are making these materials now by using fibers. Um, I don't know about the people in 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 in, in here, but. Uh, there are some tricks by embedding such materials in fibers and, and making them look different in infrared cameras and so on. That's what MIT is doing for the Soldier Now Technology Institute, actually. Um, but the point is to make that structure. And stepping back from the high physical theory and so on, now we want to <coughs> make structures like that out of particles. And this is mostly what I'm going to tell you about without too many details, but just kind of so you can know the concept. So this is a natural material like that. Now, let me remind you, we have already discussed some of the things. Now, historically, the first way people have been doing these materials is put latex particles and then they ionize them. And the electrostatic interactions repel them stronger and stronger and stronger until they kind of fill up the volume and crystallize into this long range structure. And this structure has good diffraction, interference, and so on. I mean, it's not a photonic band gap material, but you can see colors and you can study them and so on. The problem is that it's not a material, right? If it's in a liquid, in a beaker, uh, in a biopod, to be more precise, it's not exactly a material. Um, again, the spheres, this is an important basic thing. The spheres are going to crystallize when the volume fraction becomes larger than about 55% by volume. So if you take spheres and if you start compressing them, when you reach a volume fraction of about 55%, they crystallize. Or when you start deionizing, when the volume fraction due to the excluded volume because of the electrostatic repulsion, which can be estimated by what? 
of this cover here? The Debye length. You can just use it as an estimator. When the Debye length becomes comparable, the, the, the volume occupied by the Debye length becomes comparable to the, to the volume of the, of the vessel, they're going to crystallize. Of course, you need to deionize them very well, and I have been telling you these stories about people deionizing them for months and years and so on. Uh, this has been original, the original research. And then if you take uh, any types of crystals, there is this formula which relates the distance between the planes in the crystal. The sinus, the, the sign of the angle at which the light falls on the material, and the wavelength. So this is a diffraction condition. When you have this condition fulfilled, the lens is going to be diffracted, bouncing back from the material. So if you shine, if you have a crystal with, with this distance between the, between the planes of the particle, and if the angle of your falling beam is like that, light of wavelength lambda is going to be bounced back, reflected. If you plot this, when the light is perpendicular, you can see that you have this deep minima. So some of the light is actually getting, going, getting bounced back. It, it, gets, it gets reflected. But this is only one wavelength. Now, if you slightly tilt the material, so you have different types of planes. I mean, you have planes between the particles ordered in this direction, planes between the particles ordered in another direction, and so on and so forth. You can see that suddenly, this is called degeneracy. Suddenly, this degeneracy disappears. You have one minima because you have one plane already in, in that one angle, another minima for another plane, a third plane, fourth plane, and so on. Now, if the material had a very strong refractive index, so it refracted the light, reflected the light very strongly, this is going to turn into what? Here. What concept that we just described is going to emerge here? This light will be absorbed, right? No, no, this is going to be reflected. Now, this is a transmitted spectrum. If the light here is, if you don't you have this deep minima in the transmission spectrum, this means that the light is, refra is reflected back. It is reflected back because it corresponds to this condition for a crystal. So if you just shine the light perpendicularly, you only have one layer of planes which is perpendicular to the, to the light. So you have only one deep minima, only one condition is fulfilled. If you tilt the crystal a little bit, you are already having different planes in different directions, which are not only the ones which are perpendicular to the, to the light. So you're going to have light being reflected from a variety of planes in the crystal. It's a little bit difficult. I should have maybe bought a crystal model to illustrate that. You have to strain your imagination a little bit how crystal can have different planes. But if we go back to, let's say, oops, in the other direction. If we go back to this crystal, if you shine like, like, like that, uh, light like that, it gets reflected from the first layer of spheres, then from the second layer of spheres, and third layer of spheres, and so on. Now imagine right now that you, you shine a light like this. It's still going to be reflected from the first layer of spheres, the second layer of spheres, and so on. But then you also have layers of spheres like that, right? So it's also going to be reflected by the layers of spheres which form, for example, these rows in the three-dimensional depth of the material. So you're going to have different planes suddenly reflecting light. And that's why if you have this transmittance spectra, <coughs> If you shine it perpendicularly, on your only, you have only one deep minima here. This is light which gets reflected. It doesn't want to pass through the material. If you shine the light, if you shine the light at some angle, you have this collection of minima at 
a little bit different wavelength. If this were made stronger, what would happen there? Yeah, right. I mean, that's that's the point. I mean, that's this is kind of this is an illustration of how the band gap emerges now. That's for uh, kind of in a way answer Shalini question. Uh, just because you have reflectance from many different planes, and if this reflectance is strong enough to reflect all the light back, essentially all those wavelengths, this one, this one, this one, and all corresponding on all nearby wavelengths are going to be reflected. Now, this crystal is a lousy crystal because it doesn't really reflect that much. If you could make this crystal to be very strongly reflective, then it's going to reflect all, way, all, way, all wavelengths from here to here, for example. Yes, can you? So, you're showing that as the wavelength increases, different planes of the uh, crystal structure reflect the light? Right. No, as the, as the angle changes. Where is the angle? It looks like it's This is the angle of theta. This is the angle at which the light hits the crystal. It's the Bragg angle. Right. Okay. I mean, this is essentially the Bragg formula, right? It is. Right. So yeah. this is the angle at which the light hits the crystal. If it hits it perpendicularly, it only sees planes which are perpendicular <laughs> to the beam. Yeah. If you move it a little bit, you, you because you have rows of particles left to the left to the right and so on, this row suddenly become actually parts of planes which go down into the material. Oh, so this lambda is an angle here on the bottom then. Right, this is the this is the this it's is the wavelength. wavelength. Oh, it's the wavelength. Right, so you scan a different wavelength. Okay. You shine the wavelength perpendicularly and you measure which wavelength goes through. So all those wavelengths <laughs> go through, but this wavelength and that wavelength do not go through. So you should shine the light in one direction on right. the, and changing the angle, I mean, rather the wavelength? Right. No, no. In this case, you change the wavelength. You don't change the angle. Oh, okay. So you, you, you have, this is a fixed angle. End point means perpendicular, actually. To the, sorry about this crystallography term. I really don't have time to explain this talk. I just well, want I to kind of try to give you the basic concept. At a certain angle, the light is going to have only one deep minima. This is a band gap. Mm -hmm. But it's a lousy band gap because it's too thin. You want a one band, band, band gap of, of a few different kind of a whole range of frequencies. If you tilt the angle a little bit, so you shine the light, the light a little bit like that, so suddenly this crystal is going to reflect a whole range of frequencies. But it's going to do this lousily. So it's going to be more coward in a way, but most of the light will go through. So the question is, how can you make a material which will be better? And the real may, way to make it better is actually make the material continuous and to try a refractive index. Now, the latex spheres, especially if they're dispersed in water, are neither continuous na nor with high refractive index, right? So when I was a postdoc at the University of Delaware, I kind of was interested in different types of porous materials. And I came up with the idea to take a latex crystal and infuse it with silica and then polymerize the silica so it becomes solid silica and then remove the latex particles. And uh, suddenly people, uh, people who do photonic materials are very excited. Although, of course, I mean, there is lots of kind of like uh, personal ambitions in that area. So they were very excited and they started making such materials which were later called inverse opals by a variety of, of methods. And the goal here would be to make this with very high refractive index. Now the theoreticians have shown that if you make this material to be perfect and if you achieve a refractive index higher than 3, then you're going to have the craved full photonic band gap. Now, from a, from a theoretical viewpoint, this is kind of easy. I mean, like, just make it with a refractive index of 3 and you're done. But then, from the viewpoint of an experimentalist, <laughs> that's tough. Now, what's the refractive index of glass? Mm -hmm. Ooh, okay. one one right, one and a half. Yeah. So you have to have twice the refractive index of glass. And there are only very, very few selected materials like 
some crystal modifications of titanium dioxide which have this high refractive index and this crystal, these crystal modifications are formed at thousands of degrees Celsius and then if you want to have a proper material it cannot be discontinuous so the problem of making a material full photonic band gap is still outstanding however these materials are useful for a variety of other purposes at the reflective coatings surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy all types of interesting applications so we are actually working in that area without trying I mean at least in, in my viewpoint trying to reach the full photonic band gap but we want to make materials like that uh -huh. so um, how would they remove um, latex, I mean, you can remove it either by burning it out, if it's silica, it's easy to, I mean, you just put it in the oven and burn it out at 300 degrees, or you can, uh, or you can dissolve it by solvent. Actually, let me show you the next slide. <coughs> this is how we made that, actually. Um, originally, we made this with, we covered the surfaces with the, with the particles with cationic surfactant, which polymerizes the silica, assembled the particles by filtration. So you filter them and they get collected and they assemble into crystals. So once you assemble the crystals, you infuse them with silica, silica polymerizes, you take it out and then you bake it and you have this material in flakes. Uh, and then everybody wanted to make this out of everything. And um, when we joined, joined kind of like uh, so the next step of our research, we joined again the competition. People have made it out of everything that can be polymerized or molten. Um, but then uh, some physicists were trying to make this out of metal. And they had very big problems. Now, if you have listened to this class and can make the connections, you're going to tell me what the problems of making these materials out of molten metal is. Imagine you take, let's say, silica spheres and you want to infuse them with, with you, you melt a metal, like some poor physicists try to do. And then you want to infuse the molten metal with the silica crystal. What what is the problem? It won't go in with the capillary filter. Right. Yeah. It would go, won't go in because of the capillary forces. And the capillary forces are very large because the, the surface tension of a molten metal is enormous. So you have to kind of like melt the metal at a thousand degrees Celsius and then infuse it at a pressure of thousand atmospheres or something like that. So I mean this is a tough exercise. But then, uh, I mean, like as a co-ed scientist, I mean, we really don't want to have pressures and temperatures. So what I came up with is, instead of trying to melt the metal, why don't we take the metal as small nanoparticles? So we can actually first assemble the large particles, which are the template, and then assemble the metallic nanoparticles around the large particles. And then you can remove the large particles either by burning the, the, the latex out or by dissolving it. And then you end up with materials which look like that. I mean, this is a sample of materials made by various people. Silica, polymer. Uh, this one is carbon. And this one is gold. So by now, if you want a material with uniform, nice pores, you can make it essentially a fabric of every substrate available. So what is the periodicity made of? I mean, it's, it's gold, but there are bubbles of air, right, essentially? In, in, be in between the gold, but I mean, like the gold, like on that scale, I mean, you can see the bubbles of air between the gold number part. No, 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 the bigger ones. You assemble them right. around the uh, latex, right. latex particle. The so basically it's air now. Right. So what is the periodicity made of? I mean, how, how do you define this n, n is greater than 3? This, is, this, this material actually is air bubbles, periodic air bubbles in, 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 in a solid material with refractive index. So the, mat so the matrix refractive index has to be greater than 3. Right. If you make this greater than 3, it's going to have a full photonic band gap. If you remember the first image that I showed, <coughs> kind of this is actually the material which is shown here on the metropolis. This is that material here. But it's very easy to show this material here with a, with a, with a, with a refractive index of 3. Uh, it's not that easy to make it. <laughs> uh, but um, if you can make periodic air bubbles in a material with high refractive index, and if you can order them precisely, then you're really, I mean, doing great because you can make 
full photonic band gap materials. And then you can think of how to assemble them on chip. And then you can think of how to uh, eventually um, uh, make different types of photonic chips and so on. Uh, what is the refractive index of this material so far? Which one? Uh, the highest they achieved? People claim that they are approaching two. Now, one idea was uh, uh, to use, uh, an, I think it was Enantase, the, the one that has high refractive index, or Rutao, I forgot which of the two. Now, you can synthesize it at room temperature in a, in a, as a continuous titanium dioxide matrix. So we can take titanium dioxide, dioxide nanoparticles and very much similar to what we did, infuse it with titanium dioxide particles. Now, the titanium nanoparticles are going to have a refractive index of 3. But the problem is that you're going to have air around the particles, I mean in the small structure. You have to have air here in the in the large bubble but you don't have to have air here and you're having air there so the effective refractive index goes a lot decreases a lot so you can so the key is how to chemically synthesize continuous material inside this now people came up with um, silicon and germanium are not transparent to light in the visible region but uh, they're transparent to infrared light. So people came up with the concept that you can make at least an infrared photonic crystal by using titanium and germanium, which are more easy to manipulate and are semiconductor compatible. But um, I mean, it's still not it because they, they have still have high uh, absorbance. So you lose lots of things and so on. So right now, from my viewpoint, I don't think the, at least from, from the viewpoint of chemical engineers, is that worth to, to pursue the full photonic band gap, rather than understand the process of assembly, make all types of structured films, all kinds of usable materials, rather than trying to <coughs> claim that I mean we're going towards photonic chips, for example. That may be a bit of a, obviously, hype. And um, if you want to assemble them, kind of in a controlled manner, you want to assemble them in two dimensions first. And one, one way of, there are, this is an ex example of four different ways you can assemble. You can stuff them between two solid plates. Huh? Yes? I Excuse kind me? of want to go back to something earlier. How do you get rid of the latex fuse once they're in that? Uh, you burn them out or you dissolve them. But how does the dissolvent get into their, it sort of fumes like um, out? Because they're inter interconnected. You see, like, I mean, even this is very, very dense material. You see here, you have these openings between the, between the, between the, 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 the chambers. Okay. And you have openings because the spheres in the original template touch each other. Each sphere is going to touch 12 spheres in the crystal. So when you dissolve the spheres, you have kind of these windows between the, between the chambers. So it's, it's interconnected porous materials. People have thought of using this as a fil filter membrane, to which I don't see much use actually, but I mean, it's an interesting concept. Is there a problem with the um, surface tension of the solvent? No, not really, because I mean, like you don't, I mean, the solvent uh, is, I mean, if it's, a, if it's a good solvent for the polystyrene in the spheres, this means that it's going to wet them well. So penetrating inside is not a problem. It's not going to be held up by capillary force. Is there any problem with structures collapsing? Well, you have problems with the structures collapsing if it's not a good structure. I mean, that's a problem indeed. What about using other solvents like supercritical carbon dioxide? Or well, I mean, that's, that's, that's kind of goes to the range of my present projects. I mean, we we'll certainly would like to do that for one reason or another. It's not so much about the surface tension. Let me tell you about this method, and I'll come back to the topic of carbon dioxide. Now, the simplest method which you're using now essentially uses self-assembly in the thin fumes. If you remember, Brian told you a little bit about that when he was making his presentation. You have the suspension here. You have evaporation. Because of the evaporation, the liquid is going to get sucked in towards the crystal. Now, why... If we take a key more detailed look, this is actually a photo from my early paper. This has been the time where the photos were real photos. 
This means you really took them on photographic paper. And you need some time for exposure. So during the exposure, the particles that move leave, leave contrails. So you can see the dynamics here. These particles are already assembled in the crystal. These particles were assembling during the process, and these are the contrails of the particles which have moved during the assembly process, and has assemb I have assembled here at the boundary. Uh, this is an evaporation-driven process. We can do the mass balance, like Brian does these days, and you can calculate the thickness, and, and you can adjust the parameters. Just a few more important concepts here. <coughs> Depending on the film thickness, your structure is kind of predetermined. Now, if you think about photonic materials, you say, well, I don't want to make any type of crystal. I don't want to, make the, to use the crystal that nature assembles. I want to use the crystal that I design. And this crystal would be they are either hexagonal or cubic packing, depending on how thick the film is. In, in one layer of film, you can only squeeze one layer of particles, and they form a hexagonal array. In two-layer films, however, you can squeeze the particles in two, in two ways. You can squeeze them as square array, one particle on top, lying on four particles on the bottom. Or you can squeeze them as hexagonal array, where one particle on top lies on three particles on the bottom. There is a little bit of difference between the thickness here. This one is thinner. So if you have thinner film and if you push in the particles, you're going to form this. If you have thicker film, you're going to form this. But obviously, nature doesn't leave, give you much play of how you want to assemble the structure exactly. You can try to control it. But if you, want, if you say, I want to have six particles on the bottom and two particles on top and so on, it won't assemble this way by itself, right? You have to design it. And that's why the hardcore photonic materials people these days are using the concept of epitaxial assembly. So if you want to design a material in three dimensions, you can eventually design a two-dimensional template and then uh, use this two-dimensional template as a growth template for the three-dimensional crystal. So if you put in like, let's say, a layer here and then drill holes by E-beam, and then if you put the microparticles on top, then the microparticles are going to assemble in the crystal of symmetry that you like. It's an interesting concept, and I don't like it. I don't like it because it kind of cancels the, mo the major advantage of colloidal assembly. The major advantage of colloidal assembly is that, uh, I mean, it's, it's, you don't need microfabrication. In this case, you need to microfabricate a template, and then you grow crystal by colloidal assembly. In a sense, kind of you buy a Mercedes in order to move, like, I mean, some, something like from one door to another. I mean, like, you can do this simple, simpler eventually. Kind of you have to spend all those money to make a template, and then you assemble something that's dirt cheap but you assemble it on a very, very expensive template. It's like buying an expensive piece of land and then building some shack on top of it. Uh, so it's a good concept, though. I mean, it's important. This can be the way to photonic materials. Uh, then you had a, con a question, and then Christian. Can you really Maybe, maybe not. I mean, it depends on whether you can peel off the material yeah. or not. Uh, right. Uh, let me show you another type of templating, which is more promising. Now, you remember that there is one type of microfabrication, though, which is dirt cheap, which was what? Soft lithography. So if you can make something by soft lithography, then you are cool. Because you can stamp the template, kind of put a stamp, and then assemble the particles on top. And uh, this is a very good, well-known group. The leader of that group, actually, Brian, gave him some hit on the, on, the, on the conference yesterday. But I mean, like, it's a really good group. Uh, so what they, what they do is they stamp on the surface negatively charged lipid. Now, this is not any lipid. This is, if you remember, a tile. So if you have a gold layer, the tile is going to do what? 
stick. It sticks very well. So this stamp actually negatively charged circles. Now, then they backfill in a sense that the rest of the, rest of the surface would positively charge lipid. So you have a surface which has negatively charged patches surrounded by positively charged lipids. Now, if you take a positively charged particle, as so shown here, this particle is going to be attracted to the negatively charged patch. Now, this kind of, in a, in a sense, illustrates a very creative use of all those concepts that we have studied in the class. We studied surface interactions. We studied capillarity. We studied microfabrication by soft lithography. And we studied lipids. So you do microfabrication by soft lithography. You absorb the particles by using electrostatic interactions. If you compare the size of the patch to the size of the particle, if the patch is too small, because this particle is going to repel other particles of same charge, only one particle will absorb. If this patch is too large, many particles will absorb. And then you dry the, you dry the template, and you have what? What's that here? At the final stage of drying. It's just when you have this thin layer around the sphere. No, 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 no. What type of forces can occur in, in thin liquid layers with, with meniscuses? Yeah, I mean, general capillary forces. So the meniscus, actually, if you remember, is going to be between two particles, is going to, to attract them. So if you have many particles absorbing, at the end they are going to aggregate into this kind of flowers here. So they're going to form this aggregate just because the capillary, the capillary tension pulls them together. If you absorb only one particle per, per, per island, then because the meniscus is going to be like, let's say, around the patch, if you check out what's happening, this meniscus pulls in this direction, this one in this direction. This one is going to predominate. So finally, the capillary forces are going very much, pretty much to focus the particle right in the middle of the template. So this is an example. I, I don't believe that this is a very important example from the viewpoint of making photonic materials. But I think this is a very good example of kind of essentially covering all the areas that we have studied so far into a kind of nanoscale engineering. So you think about microstamping, you think about electrostatics, you think about lipids, repulsion, wetting, capillary forces. And finally, you end up with a surface which has these specific features of, of particles on the surface. <coughs> Um, you can you can vary them and so on. Um, and again, I mean, this is really from the viewpoint of, of nanoscale engineering. This is on the beginning. You can think of any other creative combination and assemble lots of interesting things. Okay, any questions so far? Uh, yes. I had a question on the previous slides <coughs> where you showed from uh, transition from this uh, hexagonal to square one. Ah, this one. Yeah, so, uh, so it will uh, depend on the particle concentration, right? I mean, when you go from one layer to the two layer, is it because there are too many particles um, and they cannot be incorporated in one layer? This, this happens, I mean, like imagine that you have a kind of, I mean, you have two surfaces which are like that. So you, you kind of fill them up with particles until you cannot push any particles anymore. So the first layer has to be hexagonal, right? Right. Because this is the, the closest part. Yeah. Now there's the two layers. Now if you if you keep if you keep the now two layers, can keep typically the closest packing for two layers would be hexagonal. Right? The kind of the, the best packing. Now this is this thickness. But now imagine that you don't let them come to this thickness. You kind of squeeze them in a thinner layer. They can't pack like that because just you don't give them enough thickness. But if they pack like this, now just imagine this particle is going to reside between four particles. So it's going to be a little bit now the hole between four whole particles is a little bit bigger, larger than the hole between three particles. 
So this particle is actually going to be a little bit further down. So in this case, this 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 cube is going to be this one is going to be square array eh? because one particle is going to lie on four particles. So we're going to have some of the few of some of the, the fumes which should should look like kind of with that symmetry. So the same thing with the with the bottom stuff, so when you try to push it up and uh, um yeah, I wouldn't say it this way because, I mean, like the particles, let's say they arrive from, in this case, from the right. So okay. they move in. But in this case, you don't have formation of, I mean, like you don't have formation of layers in this direction, right? It doesn't grow this way. It grows this way. Right, this one. This one will be hexagonal. Mm -hmm. Now, when, this, when you allow a little bit more space, like if you make the film a little bit thicker, the particles keep on arriving from right, and they form simultaneously the first and the second layer. So they don't leave the first, uh, first layer formed? Uh, well, I mean, the first la this layer will form, then you're going to have these two layers. When the particles arrive, they're going to fill up this space. And the only way they can fill up the space is actually by forming a structure like that, not like this one. If you let, just let them reside, uh, reside kind of the way they would like to, they're going to fill the space like that. This is the equilibrium stuff. But just because you, just, you perturb the thickness, you can change actually the structure, the symmetry of the thingy by, by changing the thickness. But it's very difficult to control. And I mean, Brian, Brian is studying that. So square arrays are not really left hand. That's not a good Yeah, it's, 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 a, yeah, it's a dynamic structure, let's say, like that. The equilibrium structure would be the one that has the best packing. And the best packing is when you have hexagonal structure, when the particles really come close together. But from the viewpoint of photonic materials, if you want to make something on a chip, you really want to place every particle where you would like it to be. And particles don't do this by themselves. That's the problem with, with those types of structures. Um, now, this is kind of a summary of different ways so that you can make crystals. You can make them fast. Centrifugation filtration, you can apply electrical field and bring them to the surface by electrophoresis. But this crystal are going to be kind of natural crystals, wild crystals, assembled the way you like them. You can assemble the crystals exactly the way you like them, but you have to do templating on the surface, something that is can be uh, expensive and can be slow. There are a variety of ways. I am not going to detail here in which you can assemble crystals by electrical fields. I think this is the next big thing in this area. Uh, you can assemble them by orienting them in one specific direction, or you can assemble them in thin layers. You can assemble them between two electrodes. Hopefully, you can use electrical field-driven assembly for assembling of templated stuff. But, uh, I mean, this is really the cutting edge of coidal assembly these days. So you can more or less follow the field and see what happens there. Uh, and last, I want to speak about a funny, applica uh, a funny uh, application. Before that, however, I would ask, ask Angelica to help me out a little bit. Now, we don't want to leave the evaluations for the last uh, lecture. And we're going to skip the lecture next week. So I'll ask you to fill up the evaluations. Like Angelica is going to distribute them. We're going to finish the lecture. And I'll ask you to fill them and pass them on to Angelica. Uh, your evaluations are important. This is the first class this uh, time this class has been taught. Uh, kind of your evaluations are important for feedback and essentially whether this class is going to be taught again and so on. So please uh, give your feedback and pass them on to Angelica at the end. You can just spread them around. And I'm going to finish here just um, this interesting application. Now, 
This is not a colloidal crystal, and it does not look as funny as, a, as, as well as a colloidal crystal. But this is uh, very much the future of, uh, of an industry eventually, and this is the so-called electronic ink or electronic paper. And this is a concept which emerged just, you can see, a, essentially at most five years ago or so, less than five years ago. There are startup companies which are trying to commercialize. There is lots of competition in this area. And the concept is extremely simple. I mean, that's what makes it so versatile. You can eventually take suspension, which has negatively charged white particles, for example, and positively charged black particles. You can take this suspension and you can, let's say, disperse it in polymer. So we have polymer capsules, which have some suspension inside it. And you can, do, you can even put these polymer capsules in a printer, for example, so for example, and you can print them on a surface. And then you can print electrodes on top and on bottom. And you can make those electrodes addressable. So essentially, what you are going to end up, you are going to end up with a paper which has electrodes on one side, electrodes on the other side. And right in the middle, it has these capsules with black and white particles, which if you don't apply a field, are going to be uniformly dispersed. However, if you apply the field, you can separate them. You can put the white particles on the, on the top and the black particles on the bottom. If you reverse the field, then the black particles are going to come to the top and the white particles are going to move to the bottom. So the way you see this paper is going to depend on the way you actually apply the field and the way you address the electrodes. So these days, people can make this really transparent displays where you can just buy a very small battery. And you see, like, you don't have electrical current through that capsule. So you, need, you don't need current. You don't, you don't need much of a, of, a, of a voltage. These capsules are flexible. It's really a very simple concept. So you can print them out. And you can have a screen like that, print it very, very easily, cheaply. And then you can write on this screen by using those micro capsules where you can rotate the, you can rotate the particles. You can either see the white or the black particles. And it works amazingly well. I mean, I've seen actually displays like that and so on. Uh, this is an example. He holds this sheet of electronic paper and you can and kind of the there, there there will be some connection someplace but you can immediately write on that paper. Um, this was my, my favorite story. This was the, the concept in uh, minority report. The guy who was reading the paper in the in the in the in the in the subway. Uh, so he's reading the paper and like the things get updated all the time. Now this may look like science fiction but I mean Really, this, the, there are tools which allow you to do this these days, and it's very simple. So again, kind of in that, in that area of COVID science, I mean, really, the things that you can do are really very much determined on your imagination and interest. Um, I've shown here just examples of many of the things that we have studied when it comes to nano-scale engineering, microfluidic devices, MEMS, small, small machines, droplets, microscopic droplets patterned on the surface, colloidal crystals. This is something that I have made, but this is similar to the e-ink, anisotropic white and black particles, the e-ink paper, biochips, photonic materials, DNA arrays, and so on. I mean, I. I really hope that kind of you are going to catch up with some of those things, regardless of the department, and you're going to find some application for, for similar concepts. Uh, and of course, next time, you're going to tell me about some nanoscale applications here. Um, and we're going to review the material for the class, and that's it. OK. Uh, should be in the, in the envelope. Angelica, could you give the ID?
don't make me write it on the blackboard actually. Can you? Chico, can we put this on the camera? Should be like that. That's tough. If I don't go on the other side, I won't be able to. Okay, you can zoom in on the. Okay. No, that's fine. That's fine. You can see it, right? And uh, that concludes the lecture. Also, you don't really need to record that on the video on the on the on the video stream. Yeah, you can, like you also have some. Uh, this is this is this is the feedback also for yeah. for written feedback. Did you get one of those? Yeah, did we put the other point that number? Yeah. Yeah, put right. The yeah, Angelica, please take care of it. Uh huh. Uh huh. Right. Um, you can use solvent. You can use oxidizer. You can burn it out. Huh? They come to the pores. They come to the windows between the part between the the, the 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 chambers. If you see what it looks like, you can see that we have those windows here. Now, why do we have those windows? Because in the original structure. <laughs> In the original structures, the particles are close packed, right? So they touch each other. So when you fill this with material, the material is going to go all around them, but it cannot penetrate the area where they touch each other. And this actually allows to, the, to dissolve the material afterwards because that is where the that is where the, the solvent is going to go through the next chamber and, and penetrate further down. Right, you have not this. Exactly touching, like, the, the oh yeah, they are touching. You can see some windows here, so the, all the chambers are inter interconnected. So, yeah, they, 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 they right. So from the viewpoint of a material, again, like I mean, let's forget the photonics here. If you are just interested in chemical engineering or chemical history application. Should I answer uh, from Sam? What, whatever. <laughs> I mean, kind of. I mean, I, I I haven't taken a look at that, and I mean, like it. Okay, um, so from the viewpoint of a material, this can be a very good material because in many cases, for example, for separations, you want to separate molecules or you want to separate particles. You, you want a membrane which has exactly the same pores, right? I mean, otherwise your separations are not going to be good. Uh, so from my viewpoint, this material is more important in terms of porous materials rather than photonic material. But then, I mean, of course, the, 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 the stakes for photonic materials are very high. Just because, I mean, like, imagine that you can replace computer technology with a photonic-based computer technology. I mean, obviously, that's, that, that would be cool. Um, and I guess, I mean, you have some people in your department who are working on photonic type yeah, of... Yeah, not very, but yeah, there are. Uh, so... Um, it's on youth, I think, is the main guy. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe we kind of somehow with him we, we always end up in the same way. We put in all nominations and so on. So, um, but uh, of course now there are three there are there are things of uh, there are ways in which you can think of making those in three dimensions by special microfabrication, but that's not easy. So, um, at least I I hope you got the idea. Of, I mean, like. Well, what what is this used for, and how COVID science can help here? <coughs> Have you tried electroplating those? Yeah, uh, not us, but uh, like I told you, like I mean, there was, I mean, essentially everybody and their brother immediately modifying different methods and so on. So peop some people have actually deposited both metals and semiconductors by electroplating and electro deposition essentially. Uh, so, I mean, they have, they have been deposited from by polymerization, by melting and infusion, by uh, infusion of nanoparticles, 
electropolymerization, photopolymerization, whatever method you like. The only problem is that whatever you do, it's too difficult to make it with the refractive index of 3. Has anyone tried like doing silicon colloids and then oxidizing them? Uh, perhaps, I mean, that, that would be... I mean, I'm sure that many people have, have tried using different silicon chips and Germanian chips and oxidizing them, changing the refractive index and so on. Uh, but the problem is that um, you have to have a completely dense material. Yeah, you can't have that dense. So it's, it's not easy. Okay, so I'll meet you on Thursday. Uh, Angelica, please take care of you. Uh, I'll meet you on Thursday if you have any questions or if you have not let Angelica know about your um, shortened papers, please, please do let her know.